Hello, everyone. I am Bo Walensky. I'm the author of IQ and Income and the 170th most popular book on inflation in Amazon. So I have presented a paper that I presented in my econometrics class in junior year of Center College, which is meant to be my PhD dissertation. And it was so advanced in the SAS programming that I had to do for it, that he failed to notice that the reason this back, uh, not back test, but linear regression has significant values in the parameters that I was trying to test is because I used nonlinear GMM, generalized method of moments, heteroscedastic corrected errors. So, Normally, when people try to compute a dollar value on these regressions, they cannot compute an exact dollar figure. And that's untrue if you use nonlinear GMM because it corrects the heteroscedasticity within it just by the sake of having used BREG instead of REG. And if you had used REG, yes, you would have to transform the income into logarithmic forms and that just it's not that I don't know how to calculate those percentages is that percentages is not the point of IQ and income the point of IQ and income once you understand that this is a real data set this isn't made up and all the information that was done on the project was submitted to center um, now, I'm not going to say what my professor actually wrote in response to what I'd written, because it looked like he wanted to give me 100. And I feel like there were some smart alecks present to him that I just wasn't interested in knowing that I'd done a project for econometrics that was clearly superior to everything that had ever been done at Center College. And he just didn't want to give me that recognition. So the point of this regression is to find the value of a percentile of IQ. Now, how do we measure IQ? Well, there were five different ways, the SAT scores, the ACT scores, and the ASAB, a composite of the ASAB for all genders, and the separation of genders. So I was not trying to show any type of disparity between males and females. It was just easier to use males because they're typically uh, the most employable and I won't say easily likable. There are situations where women will be preferred to men just for the sake of personality. But this is not the point of the regression was to, you know, test for that kind of likelihood. The very foundation of this is the Armed Forces Qualification Tax, which per percentile from one to 99 is $263.90 per percentile. So no matter what, even if you're a 99 percentile in the United States, at least in 2001, you would still only earn $26,126.10. That's it. This intercept is there to make all these parameters in the regression able to be calculated. So I'm just going to go over which of these parameters were the most significant. We can ignore this intercept. And the first, and the only one I really wanted to know, was the $263.90 value of a percentile on the Armed Forces Qualification Test, now known as ASVAP, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. This next one, obviously introduces some frank discussion over what qualifies as educational attainment is the 6,163 and three cent value in annual income uh, for a person who has a male with certificate. This is the next one, male with high school, $1,645.66. Obviously, if these are your only two levels of educational attainment, something is wrong beyond just your level of intelligence. So for a more, I would say, not well-to-do, but mature families, 
The male with associates, $7,497.57. Significant at the 5% level. And obviously, the point of this regression, as we get higher in educational attainment, uh, male with Bachelor of Arts degree, $20,656.10. Significant at the 1% level. Male with Bachelor of Science degree, $27,482.10, also significant at the 1% level. Male with master's degree, obviously a much older person, so they're going to lose some in their age because you always lose $532.39.2 um, as you get older for each year you age. And for the male with master's is $39,573.10. The male with doctoral, the PhD, $30,066.90. So not as much as the master's. And I felt that that was because the master's has MBAs included in it. But doctoral includes things like, you know, symphony and orchestra, religion, history. Obviously subjects that you can only take to become either a professor or some type of teacher. Uh, male with professional degree, $80,631.80. That includes accountants, lawyers, doctors, and accountants. Yes, accountants. Average hours worked per week. This is not insignificant. There were some people working 168 hours. Obviously, some people now have jobs at zero. $443.23 is how much for each average hour increase you would be paid for every additional hour of work you worked during the next year. If you had psychological problems, this is an 8,507.37 loss, significant at the 1% level. The experience in terms of weeks tenured means simply how many weeks have you been in your current position? So for each week current in your position, you make an additional at the end of the year, $12.87.3, significant at the 1% level. Health problems that limit work. Obviously, if you cannot get up or you're blind, maybe you're deaf, but you still were, uh, you're going to lose at least $2,712.45 every year uh, annually. And these other variables are not very significant because most of this uh, data set is white Caucasian males. The Asians, I will say, did have very high average uh, IQ scores in this test, but I think that was partially out of how this test was conducted. Basically, in 1979, the United States government said, we want to test a sample of people, you know, ten, over 10,000 of them. So they tested uh, about 12,686 of these individuals, tracked them from date of birth, 1979 to the year 2001. And in mid-2003, the data said that you see used in Ernst and Murray's IQ and income seminal piece, the bell curve, uh, is the inspiration for this piece. It's because if I hadn't read the bell curve, I would not have known about this data set. And also, most of you will not ever be able to understand how this impacts you. But what this was intended to show for N not this intended, but this entire presentation is about this whole table and what it means when you actually compute uh, how much money a person can actually make being a peon. If you're employed by someone and you don't own the company, this regression is for you. But this does not apply to actors, musicians, uh, famous people like the Queen of England, uh, High Queen. Uh, this regression is mainly for the people that want to work for somebody. I'm not really that somebody, I gotta be honest. I'm more entrepreneurial, but I do have an academic flair to my approach. Uh, so 
going on with this, we saw that health problems that limit work obviously take away income. They take away $2,712.45. These next four are not the point of this, but if you're an Asian male, you get $7,351.06 just for being an Asian male. White males or Caucasian. This was significant at the 1% level. Our favorite. $4,644.87, not as much as the Asians. That's because they were taking on more technical work than any of these other cohorts. Black males, still positive, $2,391.46, also significant at the 5% level. And for any other males, if you're not black, white, Asian, uh, there was no other way to make this data set more compact. So it just classifies it as another uh, race. So $3,263.81 plus, none of these have appeared to be of any significance. They just seem to be bonuses for your luck in life and having been born to different heritage. In married male with child, obviously we would expect the male to work significantly harder if he feels he has to take care of his child and of course he's married that factored into it so this was significant at the one percent level eighty three hundred ten dollars and sixty three cents is how much income a married male with child will not receive they will work for it but generally if you're married male with child we're just assuming that they are working harder and probably more hours and the slash variable, age of the person in terms of years, you lose $532.39.2 for each year you advance in age. This regression had 6,286 observations, an R squared of 34.09% and an adjusted R squared of 33.89%. I was not targeting the highest R squared because it's spurious. The point of this regression is to come out with what was the most explanatory table of values. So we can ignore about nine, 800 values from this sixth specification. And that's what these are. Each of these columns is a specification I tried just to figure out the effect of each, but experience is always the most significant variable. And I could not add age of the person in terms of years because some of these um, other changes to the specification, they weren't changes to the model. This, the, this model used every single quantitative value and dummy variable that could be exploitatively found and then research. This research, should you receive a grant from the US government to continue this project would allow you to identify each of these individuals personally in some way and still be able to ask them questions if you were a researcher. This research project ended, uh, published as the Bureau of Labor Statistics National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, 1979, in 2001, studying individuals born about half and half between male and female on 1979 or during the year. And they tracked all these values and put together this data set called an LSY, NLSY 79 from the BLS. That is the data set I use to compute these values and you should not dispute them. Because ultimately what they allow you to do is estimate any level of educational attainment based on your IQ score. These other issues you can probably ignore in hiring, like psychological problems and health problems. Uh, age in terms of years, obviously not supposed to discriminate in terms of age and years, but statistically we do lose I would say at least some pet between 30 and 70 working. So this is an example of my family. Uh, this is me, I'm Bachelor of Science. 
I have actually never had a full-time job, but I do regularly work more than 40 hours a week. But we'll just say I work 40 hours a week. Uh, this is at two years. Uh, I've worked 17 years, so we're just doing computers real fast. 52 times 17. And I am 35 as of the date of this recording. And so we come out with a GDP deflator value in the 2001 base year that we can only adjust using the 2018 value of 105.52 compared to the 76.14 of the 2001 GDP deflator. So this is not our math. I'll show it to you. We're just summing up which of these flags, which of these values multiplied by these parameters. I know I'm not going to explain this, but it is true for me. Uh, so when you adjust the GDP deflator, is a simple compounded computation where you take the value in the most recent year, divide it by the base year, and simply multiply your previous value, which leaves $113,273.12 compared to an $81,734.41 2001 value for an hourly wage that is simply computed. This is easy to explain because I spent so much time uh, working with this, but your hourly wage assumption is going to be based on that adjusted GDP deflator value in the most relevant year. So once you've adjusted that, you can calculate your hourly wage assumption based on, of course, your answers to the dummy variables. Uh, and adjusting for age. So for me, I think at age 40, I'd want to see what I ought to make. I am certainly way beyond what this value is being an accredited investor. Um, so uh, at 40, you see that goes down, but I'll have five more years experience, so I'll have to add five more years here. Let's make this 22. Uh, and I seem to have still kept uh, pace with this hourly wage or something. Now, this is a simple calculation too for me because what I am doing in this uh, calculation is finding this 10-year projected salary based on a compounded rate that is likely to continue into the future so that this adjusted GDP deflator value allows me to compound out for 10 years using this period's growth rate so that I can find what I will earn in 10 years. Now, this is something I say would be pretty appetizing to many people, but pretty much I'm more than benefited from the fact that I'm all of these races. I'm, I hate to say that. I'm not telling you what the other one is, but you might be able to figure it out from the tone of my voice and the fact that these are all dollar signs. And as I said, uh, this is a simple thing to do. You just Put in your armed forces IQ score. What was your percentile? Now it's known as the percentile on the ASVAB. You put a one for your highest level of educational attainment and basically put that value here, multiply it by there, and you get these income levels. And that is the use for the IQ and income book by Bo Walensky. I am an econometrics expert empirical analysis 
is also an expertise of mine. And from being a financial economist at Center College with a mathematics minor, I did try to pursue a second minor in computer science, decided that the stuff I was learning in econometrics and empirical was the information I wanted to share with the world. And I have. This paper has actually been available for more than 10 years. And if you choose to purchase, I appreciate it. Um, it will certainly be a great handout to anyone looking for an intro to econometrics and advanced methods to correct for heteroscedasticity. Uh, this data set is a real data set. I hope it's still around and I hope the software program that allowed me to extract the data that basically wrote the data into my SAS code, uh, that's all it did. I had to do several hours and hours and days and weeks of studying these just to come up with all seven of these specifications. Most of the papers I heard about had no more than two specifications. I corrected and identified <laughs> every bias, including the omitted variable bias, which is there can't be any omitted variable bias. The richest company in the world sponsored a study on 12,686 <laughs> persons for over a lifetime of college and attainment and kept tracking them until age 40. <clears throat> so these individuals, I know you can gain access to identifying them personally if you would like to study this further. This is a PhD topic that I would have loved to explore as a PhD financial economist, but I chose to become an investment advisor as a graduate and eventually as a commodity trading advisor. Now I am exempt as a robo-advisor and carry on through windows such as these and mostly from a supercomputer in my trading room. So that is what I have to share. I hope you enjoyed this video and please understand this is a true dissertation by a bachelor's of science from Center College, one of the top 50 liberal arts schools and institutions in the United States, and has hosted the 2000 and 2012 vice presidential debates. That is its claim to fame. If you have not heard of it, many liberal arts institutions will claim these things, but if you're not coming away with calculus and, and adversely positive view on the diversity of education. I sincerely appreciate what I learned at Center College and it carries on today in my mannerisms and especially in my work as a quant and arbitration. Thank you. Bye.